Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 20. Hear the word of the living and the true God. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Thus far is the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the technology that allows us to get the message of your gospel out. Uh, God, we pray now that you would send your spirit to wherever people are hearing this. Lord, open up ears, eyes, hearts, and minds to receive your word for what it truly is. God, we pray that you would shape us through the preaching of your word, and may you be honored in us, we pray in your name. Amen. So we continue with our Exodus series. Uh, over the last 11 Sundays, we've been doing a series through the Ten Commandments, and yes, I can count. Uh, we did two sermons on the Fourth Commandment, which is why we get to 11 instead of only 10. And so we pick up now our story following the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Now to recap, we had seen God miraculously deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt and brought them up through the Red Sea, brought judgment on Pharaoh, brought judgment on his army, and God glorified himself over his triumph over the false gods of the Egyptians. God then led his people through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, where he descended in smoke and fire. And it was here in this setting that God delivered his law. Now, as we went through the Ten Commandments, we saw that they serve as the foundation of the rest of the law. Uh, the Ten Commandments each sort of function as a heading. Exodus 34 verse 28 described the Ten Commandments as the words of the covenant. So in the Ten Commandments, what you have here is something of a summary for the entire rest of God's law. Now, if you remember the summary that we've been giving, we've been uh, describing the Ten Commandments under this summary, saying, number one, all men must worship the one true and living God. Commandment number two, they must do so rightly, worshiping him in the way that he himself has ordained. Number three, they must do so reverently. All men must Honor God's name as holy. Commandment number four, they must worship him regularly, keeping holy to God such set times as he hath appointed in his word. Number five, we are to honor the authorities that God has put in place, whether those are in the state, in the church, or in the home. Honor father and mother. Commandment number six, do not murder. We must respect our neighbor's life. Number seven, do not commit adultery. We must respect our neighbor's wife. Commandment number eight, do not steal. We are called here by God to respect our neighbor's property. Number nine, do not bear false witness. We must respect our neighbor's good name. And number 10, do not covet. We must not even allow any negative thoughts, emotions, feelings, or attitudes toward our neighbor and everything that is theirs. So the summary that Jesus gives us of the law is this. When Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second commandment, he said, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, well, we will honor him as God. We will not have any other gods before him. We will worship him in the way that he ordains. We will, of course, show reverence to his name, and we will worship him regularly as he has required of us. And, of course, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, we will do no harm to our neighbor. As Romans 13 verse 9 says, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. 
So the Ten Commandments were given to us as the foundation of God's law, and they would provide the very basis that Israel's society was to be built upon. The Ten Commandments are, as we've discussed, a reflection of God's own holy character, and they are therefore binding on all peoples, in all places, and at all times. The Ten Commandments are absolutely vital for us as Christians, which makes sense since if we love God, we of course are going to want to know, how can I live in a way that will be pleasing to God? Since we were made to glorify God, we want to know, how can we glorify God? How do I live in a way that will be pleasing to God, that will be glorifying Him, that will be fulfilling the purpose for which I have been created? And so we glorify God by loving Him and obeying His commands and law. The Ten Commandments, therefore, are extremely important for the Christian life. We even see that when God transforms our hearts through the miracle of regeneration or conversion, uh, what we call being born again, one of the things that the Spirit does in our conversion is to write the law of God upon our hearts. That's according to Jeremiah 31, verse 33. So if God's law is a reflection of God's own holy character, if it is binding on all peoples, in all places, at all times, and if part of our very conversion itself involves the Spirit writing the law on our hearts, then do you think maybe we'd want to know what it says? I firmly believe that every Christian should have the Ten Commandments memorized. So anyway, this is the recap of where we are in our story. God has now given his law to his people, and he did so in dramatic fashion. Look with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. We see here that God descends on Mount Sinai in smoke and fire, and there is thunder and lightning, and the earth, the whole mountain is trembling, and there is a trumpet blast that just goes louder and louder and louder. And so this makes a lot of sense when we come now to uh, verse um, 18 of chapter 20, where it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Now, I can only imagine what this scene would have looked like. And when the people saw it, they were understandably terrified. Consider Israel has witnessed the power of God. Very likely, the last time that they saw a thunderstorm that was mixed with fire, it was a plague upon the Egyptians, bringing down judgment uh, as fire, thunder, and hail devastated the land of Egypt, striking down every last man, woman, or animal that was caught outside in this storm. And so now in this situation, as the people have consecrated themselves for three days, uh, they have been preparing themselves mentally and emotionally and physically. They have set up boundaries along the mountains so that nobody would touch it and bring judgment upon themselves. Uh, they have been preparing together as a congregation to meet with the Lord. And as he now descends on Mount Sinai in smoke and fire, it is just too much for them to bear. And they tremble and cry out to Moses, You speak to us, but do not let God speak to us anymore, uh, lest we die. The people here call for a mediator. They want there to be a go-between, somebody who would stand between them and the Lord and speak to them on God's behalf. And so this is what Moses becomes for the people. Moses will represent the people to God, and he will represent God to the people. That's the role of an intercessor, of a mediator, somebody who comes between. One commentator writes on this, Ever since Adam fled... Upon hearing God's voice in the garden, sinful man has not been able to bear either to speak to God or to hear from him immediately. Now, to hear from him 
immediately is without a mediator. The fact is, our sin makes the presence of God unbearable to us. Like Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes to hide their uh, shame and their nakedness from their creator, this has continued to be the case for all of their offspring. And so Israel here cries out for a mediator, someone who would stand in their place, who would be their representative before God so that they would not have to deal directly with God. Verse 20, Moses, as their mediator, says to the people, Do not fear, God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Now there's a really, really interesting sentence. Notice what he says here. Do not fear, God is testing you, that, what? That the fear of him may be before you. So notice, Moses says, do not fear that the fear of him may be before you. Now, I think if we're going to make sense of this, we need to realize that there are different types of fear. There is a good and a righteous fear of the Lord. And of course, there is an ungodly form of fear. What is ungodly fear? What is Moses warning the people against, telling them not to? To have. Well, ungodly fear is fear that drives us away from God. It is a type of fear that causes us to resent God. It is a fear of his judgment that produces no holy reverence, but only works in us an ungodly form of terror. I think there is no better example of this kind of fear than what we see in the great reformer Martin Luther. Prior to the Reformation, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk who was absolutely terrified of God. Luther, like many of the other monks, would spend hours and hours confessing his sins. He would go and do all of the things that he was told to do in order to gain merit before God, and so hopefully bring some peace to his tortured conscience. Luther himself writes of the type of fear that he had of God. He says, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. Men may fear God with an unrighteous form of terror. And so for Martin Luther, it was a very intense fear of judgment, which was only made worse by the false doctrines that he had been taught in the Roman Catholic Church. This kind of fear causes resentment and hatred of God, and rather than growing in love for God, being in awe of his grandeur, his holiness, and his majesty, ungodly fear drives men away from God. It causes bitterness, not reverence, hatred, and not holiness. And so Moses here declares to the people, do not fear. God has not come to destroy you, but notice what he says. He has come to test you. God is not coming upon his people in vengeance as he did against the Egyptians. That is not the purpose of his appearing in this dramatic fashion. Rather, notice what Moses says. God has come to test the people. As the pulpit commentary says, to test them whether they were inclined to submit themselves to God or not. So because of this, they are not to have this ungodly form of terror and dread, but rather God wants them to have the type of fear that will prevent them from sinning. Notice, let's read our text. Do not fear, it's the ungodly fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may 
not sin. This is a godly form of fear which keeps us from sinning. This is a reckoning with the God of all things and being awestruck by his holiness. This is gaining a view of God's righteousness and power and beauty and being rightly motivated to never sin against such an awesome, powerful, and glorious God. God's intention was not to fill them with the kind of dread that would drive his people away from him, but rather to give them a display of his power and his majesty that would cause them to take very seriously all of his commandments. When you face temptation to break one of God's commandments, remember the God who gave them to you. Remember this scene as God delivered his law. Remember the smoke and the fire, the thunder and the lightning, the trembling mountain and the supernatural trumpet blast. This is not a God to be trifled with. God's intention is that the fear of him would be upon his people so that they might not sin. Now, I believe that the church has suffered through pastors and Christians who have rejected the concept of the fear of God. You'll hear people speak from past experiences where they've maybe been manipulated through fear. People have used the ungodly fear to try to produce something in them. They do not have, in that form of fear, they do not have any love for God or reverence for God. But rather, like Luther, they were simply terrified of God's judgment. And so for these people, they'll tell their stories that later in life, as they discover that God is also a God of love, well, they tend to have a pendulum swing. They overcompensate. The pendulum swings across to the other extreme, and they completely reject all notions of God's wrath, and they hate the idea of having any fear of God, as this simply reminds them of the negative experiences they had earlier in life. And so they reject not only the bad kind of fear, but quite frequently reject the good kind of fear as well. But notice from verse 20, God intends a righteous form of fear to prevent us from sinning. Notice, that's God's purpose. That is his intention. It should really not surprise us that the people who do away with these concepts, who reject the ideas of the wrath of God and the fear of God, frequently end up being very soft on sin. These people end up with a very permissive stance. And that shouldn't surprise us since scripture teaches us that the righteous fear of God is something that helps us to prevent sin. For the redeemed heart, I believe that there are very few more powerful aids to our sanctification than to grow in the fear of the Lord. To simply gain a greater understanding of who our God truly is, to glimpse his glory, to see his majesty. For us, if we could even begin to comprehend a small fraction of the fullness of our God, I believe our minds would be so completely overwhelmed with awe and reverence and fear of the Lord that sin would lose its luster. The thought of offending such a great God would fill us with such dread that we would be driven to banish any such thought from our minds. And I believe it is only the mind that has thoroughly suppressed its knowledge and memory of the holiness of God that can entertain thoughts of sin. In order for sin to be attractive or seem like anything other than suicidal insanity, we must, at least temporarily, neglect the fear of of God. We must drive him momentarily out of our minds so that we are not thinking about his glorious presence, his holy countenance, or the pains of hell that he has promised for sin. 
If you have a proper fear of your maker, you will not be so easily enticed by sin. If you remember that there is a God in heaven who knows your every thought, who is with you at all times, a God who sees everything that you do, a God who has given you commandments and is the righteous God whom you will one day face, all of this together will have a powerful effect in you to keep you from sinning. You cannot lie to God. You cannot escape his presence. However, you may hide your porn habit from your wife or your parents. God knows. God sees. Even if nobody else sees you watching that TV show, God knows. God sees. Even if no one else is around when you use bad language, God knows. God hears. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And that's Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12. In order for us to sin, we must actively suppress our knowledge of God. We need to push the fear of God out of our minds. We must remove God from the throne of our hearts so that we can instead serve our sinful desires rather than him. Or perhaps we try to make a calculated decision. We think, you know, I, I'm a Christian. Jesus died for my sin. He'll forgive me if I do this, won't he? Would you dare presume upon the grace of God? Would you spit upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Would you dare to treat the death of the Son of God as though it were meant to give you a license for your sin? Do you really believe that Jesus suffered and died so that you could indulge your carnal lusts? May it never be. Jesus did not suffer so that his people could intentionally live in high-handed rebellion to him while escaping the fiery consequences. No. Jesus came to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's Titus 2 verse 14. Jesus bore your sins in his body on the tree, and in your conversion you were crucified with him, then buried with him through baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Leave your sins in that grave. They are not part of your new life with Christ. Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be upon you, that you may not sin. The righteous fear of the Lord prevents sin. And the righteous fear of the Lord orders our lives as believers. The righteous fear of the Lord gives us courage. The fact is, true courage is not a matter of having no fear. True courage is found in knowing what to fear and what not to fear. As the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell? I'll give you a hint, it's not the devil. The fact is, hell was made for the devil and his angels, and they also will be tormented there. God is the one who can destroy both soul 
and body in hell. God is the one who holds all of your life in his hands. God is the judge that you will one day face. And so Jesus tells us not to fear those who can only, who can merely kill the body but cannot touch the soul. Rather, Jesus tells us to fear the one who holds your life and your eternity in his hands. True courage is found in knowing who to fear and who not to fear. If you have the right kind of fear of God, this will dramatically help you to not fear man. Jesus points out that what man can do to you only can affect you in this life. And in comparison to eternity, this lifetime will look like nothing. It will be dust on the scales, a drop in the bucket. And so if you must choose between the fear of man and the fear of God, be aware that you are choosing between consequences in this life versus consequences forever. It is foolishness beyond all imagining to exchange eternity for comforts in this life. And it is similarly foolish to fear man more than we would fear God. True and righteous fear of the Lord powerfully equips you and gives you the strength and resolve that you will need to take a stand for God. It gives you the strength and resolve you will need to not give in to the fear of man. Fear and reverence for God will cause you to honor him and obey him when the fear of man would tempt you to deny him. In whatever situation you face, fearing God more than anyone else will help you be faithful. Just consider how different would you respond if you feared God more than losing human approval. How different might that opportunity you had to witness have gone if you feared God more than man? How different might things have been in that situation where you faced peer pressure if you had feared God more than man? Now, I find in my own life that I frequently lack uh, perspective. Quite honestly, the kinds of things that stress me out, that produce anxiety in me, kinds of challenges that would really bring me down, are embarrassingly light. Consider this, what is anxiety but fear of a hypothetical future? Anxiety is that little voice that speaks to your subconscious and says, something really bad is going to happen. Anxiety then pulls those negative emotions from that hypothetical future and brings them into your present and tries to make you live in the misery of something that hasn't even happened yet. And so when I give in, when I let my anxieties run rampant, I find myself dwelling in the negative emotions that my fears are telling me are going to come in my future. Anxiety is a prophet. It is a gloomy prophet. And it is a false prophet. It is a prophet that declares to you that you must abandon all hope. And it is therefore a false prophet because no matter what happens in this life, if you are in Christ, you have hope. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This was meant to give courage. In this passage, Jesus was actually addressing his disciples and warning them that persecution is going to come. But he tells them not to fear this persecution, And he tells them that the antidote to fear of man is the fear of God. It's 
the fear of God. To remember the fear of God is to be ever aware of his absolute power. To fear God is to be reminded at all times that he is the sovereign. He is the ultimate. Not only does he hold eternity in his hands, but he holds the life that you live right now. Who do you think it is that keeps your heart beating? Who gives you every breath of air? Do you think that just happens by itself? Jesus continues encouraging his disciples and he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. The God who holds eternity in his hands has a running tally on the number of hairs on your head. He knows the precise number of red blood cells in your veins. He has perfect knowledge of the bacterial organisms in your stomach that are helping you digest your food. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the sovereignty of God. Our God is not a detached and preoccupied God, one who is so busy running the important things of the universe that he cannot come down to you. Our God is infinite. And one of the things that this means is that he has the, the mental capacities, so to speak, if we can use human language and bring it up to God. Uh, he has the mental capacities that allow him to keep the planets all spinning in their orbits, that allows him to simultaneously uphold the law of gravity, keep your heart beating, keep your cells functioning, keep a running tally on the number of hairs on your heads, hear and answer the prayers of millions of saints praying to him simultaneously. He does all of this and doesn't even lose track of the sparrows. Brothers and sisters, how much more valuable are you than the sparrows? Now, I don't know what God has in store for us. I don't know what the next days and weeks and months and years may hold. But I do know one thing. God will be there. He will be there giving strength to his people. He will be there providing them with the courage that they need to face down their other fears. Whatever path our sovereign God may ask us to walk, he has promised to go with us. Anxiety seeks to drive us to despair. Yet for the Christian, the one who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, who has been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was chosen from before the foundation of the world by the electing grace of the Father, whose every day has been ordained by God, for that person, there is never reason to despair. The solution to our fear, our fear of man, our fear of death, our fear of judgment, the solution to all of those is found in the righteous fear of the Lord. This righteous fear of God drives away other fear. There is comfort found in the fear of God. And this is only possible because our God has chosen to be gracious to us. In our story, we saw that Israel did not need to fear God with the same kind of terror felt by the Egyptians, because God had chosen Israel to be his covenant people. God had chosen to be gracious to Israel and to give them mercy. If they would trust in the promises of God, if they would put their faith in him, he would count their faith as righteousness and they would be reconciled to him. And they would then not need to fear no matter what enemies came against them. <clears throat> In 
and it is very, very similar for us. What God was foreshadowing in and through Israel, he brought to completion through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Israel, as they cried out in fear of God, as they cried out, they rightly recognized their need for a mediator. They needed a go-between, someone who could intercede on their behalf before the Lord. And as we saw, Moses performed this role for Israel, but his role as mediator and prophet was merely setting the stage for a greater prophet, a better mediator. One who would not only deliver God's law to God's people, but would actually fulfill it on their behalf. Israel, in one sense, was right to be terrified. Consider they were sinners standing before a holy God. The terror they felt, seeing the smoke and the fire, the thunder and the lightning, really was a fitting illustration of how the holy law of God meets the sinner. To those outside of Christ, to those who have not received saving grace, the law of God is a terrifying sentence of judgment. It is a mountain of terror and condemnation, because as God's law is read, what it does is it removes all of our excuses and it shows us our guilt. When God's holy law is read, we are left with no answers to give, no excuses to make. Ever since Adam sinned, there has been no possibility for us to earn a right standing before our God. God's law for Israel was not ever given as a means of earning righteousness before the Lord. Rather, what it did was it showed them their guilt and their need for grace and mercy. The law pronounces us guilty. And there is truly nothing more terrifying than to be found guilty before the judge of all the earth. But the good news of the gospel is that there is a mediator. Jesus Christ is our go-between. Jesus fulfilled the law of God on behalf of his people. Picture if Jesus were to stand before the Father as judge, if he were to be evaluated, if the life of Jesus was evaluated according to the standards of God's law, Jesus would be declared righteous. He did not commit even one sin, but lived perfectly according to every commandment of God. Not a single unrighteous thought, emotion, or action. Furthermore, in his death on the cross, Jesus took the penalty that is due to his people for their sin. As Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And so those wages, that which we have earned, rightfully earned, for our breaking of God's law was poured out on Jesus. He paid our penalty. He died in our place. And on the third day, the first day of the week, Jesus rose back to life, breaking the power of death. And so these three major problems that we had, the fact that we are sinners and deserve judgment, the fact that we lack the righteousness needed to stand before God, and the fact that we are under the curse and the power of death, were all solved for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He took our judgment in his death. He provided our righteousness through his perfect life. And he defeated the power of death through his resurrection. Christ then ascended into heaven and took his place at the right hand of the Father, where he now lives as our mediator, our intercessor, our go-between. On our behalf, he is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Ever since Adam hid in the garden from the presence of the Lord, 
man has not been able to stand before God without a mediator, and we now have a perfect mediator in the person of Jesus Christ. As Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Because of the work of our mediator, our fear of God is no longer the terror of his judgment and the horror of being under his sentence of condemnation. Because of our mediator, we can approach God in reverent confidence, knowing that we are accepted before him through Christ. All the terror of judgment for us is taken away through the gospel. When Martin Luther discovered the gospel, when he found in the scriptures the truth that God credits the righteousness of Christ to us through faith, his terror melted away. And he wrote, reflecting on his first experience of this, where he says, Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. This is why we need not fear whatever we may face in this life. We have been reconciled to that which is ultimate in the universe. Through Jesus Christ, we are adopted as children of the Most High God. Through Christ, we receive eternal life. Through Christ, we are now on the right side of history. We are Christ's fellow heirs, the inheritors of this universe. Though the nations rage against God and against his Christ and may rage against his people, they will be shown to be nothing but rebels who set themselves up against the King of Kings. For those who are loyal to his throne and the crown rights of King Jesus, they will be rewarded. If we fear our King, if we fear our Lord more than anything else, we will never betray his kingdom. So, my brothers and sisters, do not fear God, for he has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you. Fear God, do not fear death. Fear God, do not fear a virus. Fear God, do not fear fines and tickets. Fear God, do not fear imprisonment. Fear God, do not fear the scorn of man. Fear God, do not fear oppressive governments. Fear God, do not fear persecution. Fear God.